please join me in welcoming to the Distinctive Voices podium, Dr. Felix Warnikin. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer, for the kind introduction. I'm very honored to be here in this wonderful auditorium. I'm also happy that I was able to come during this time of the year to get a little bit of break from the winter in Michigan. Um, so I think um, getting the sunlight will, will push me through the next two months. OK. Um, let's imagine the following situation, maybe a little bit further up, say, in Oregon, on a rainy day, you're walking across a parking lot, and you see someone, umbrella in one hand, groceries in the other hand, fiddling around with the car keys to try to open the trunk that, of course, fall to the ground. I think, or I hope at least, that you would walk over and maybe hold the umbrella or help them to open the trunk to put the groceries away. Why would you do that? How do we become this way, how do we develop this mindset to not only always care about ourselves, but under at least some circumstances care about others? So what is the nature of our cooperative tendencies to sometimes even act altruistically to um, do something that is of no obvious immediate benefit to ourselves, but to the benefit of another individual? Well, one reason could be that we have learned from our parents to be good citizens, that we have internalized social norms about how to be good, right? And there's reason to believe that that is the case. Obviously, we are infused with all these expectations about what's the right thing to, to do. However, maybe this is not everything, right? Maybe there's more to this development of our cooperative tendencies than just being socialized into being a good person. The issue with this is that when we look at adults alone who have gone through many years of um, experience interacting with other people, having very sophisticated thoughts about um, what other people think about me and how they will tell other people about what I did or didn't do and, and things like that, it's just untraceable what exactly are the motives here. It's really hard to disentangle all of these things. And what I think is um, a very informative way to try to understand all the factors that come into play um, for these cooperative behaviors is to look at these critters here, to look at children, very young children, to basically go to the starting state of social behaviors and try to understand better what are the kinds of things that we may be predisposed by human nature to do, and what are the kinds of things that um, shape us over development um, to turn into the mature um, beings that we are, okay? So what I want to do today is go on a journey, basically, to the starting state of human cooperative uh, behaviors. And I want to contrast two different views. So what I would call the old view, or maybe it's also the standard view in the behavioral sciences, is that we start out purely selfish. That babies originally are selfish, have some interest in socially interacting with others, but have no real inclination to care about the welfare of others. And it is then only over time that they transform from being purely selfish into being cooperators that in addition to selfish inclinations um, in some circumstances also care about others. And this view also assumes that it's through social learning, through socialization practices, through internalizing moral and other kinds of um, cultural norms that children basically are reprogrammed from being these selfish individuals to adopting also altruistic motivations, okay? So this is a wildly held belief, and um, um, I would think this is still the, the standard view even um, in developmental psychology. What I wanna propose is that this is actually not the right way of thinking about it, and obviously I present some evidence uh, to support this. Um, so the new view, I think, is to rather characterize the development of 
cooperative behaviors, including altruistic behaviors, is something where kids out, start out as naive cooperators that are, um, and turn into mature cooperators where early on, already altruistic and other cooperative motives are co-present with our selfish motives. And then over time, they expect. So what I want to present to you today is that we find already in very young children that they have these altruistic inclinations. And over development, what is happening is that these altruistic inclinations expand, that over time, ch children learn to be cooperative in more domains than they were previously to more different people. Um, and importantly, they also learn over time when not to be cooperative because there are many situations in which that might not be a good thing to do because if you're interacting with someone who's basically exploiting your cooperative spirit, um, it's just not a viable strategy to keep cooperating with a so-called defector, right? So these are the kinds of things that I believe children learn uh, over time, starting uh, as more naive cooperators that um, cannot protect themselves against others who exploit their cooperation, and then over time I learn how to make the right decision when to cooperate and when not to cooperate. And the role of social learning experience and cultural norm is of course important, but it's not a reprogramming from an initially completely selfish individual, but an individual has both altruistic and selfish motives that can be activated in different kinds of situations. And then development means to learn under what circumstances um, to do what and to learn, for example, fairness norms that allow us to uh, balance the kinds of uh, um, decision when to, uh, to find the right balance between one's own need and another person's need, okay? So that's the, the, the basic um, claim I wanna make uh, today. And um, I wanna take you on a trip to these early forms of uh, helping behaviors um, or cooperative behaviors in young children. And for me, this actually started when I was just starting as a graduate student, where I worked in a lab in, in Germany, where the major interest was in trying to understand basically how children read other people's minds. So when they see someone um, extending an arm towards an object, are they able to make an inference about the goals that the person is trying to achieve, right? So when we see someone reaching for something, we attribute an intention to that person. We realize this is not gymnastics or something like that. And um, we are able to infer something about the other person's mind, that in this case, for example, the person has the goal of grasping the object, okay? So that's what I started out with. And what I um, thought was, well, helping situations are actually maybe a good test case for this to what extent kids are able to read another person's goal, right? Because in order to help someone with a problem, you have to understand that uh, when, for example, an object fell to the ground and someone is trying but failing to get it back, um, this person has a, a goal in mind that does not match with reality, right? The reality is something is, an object is out of reach, but what they want is to have the object, okay? And so I had this idea, oh, what if um, someone is trying to put a hat on and then the hat falls to the ground in front of a toddler and see to what extent they would then help by picking it up and returning it to the person. And when I proposed this to more senior members in the lab, they said like, no way. If you drop something in front of a toddler, they would just hold on to it, will never ever give it back, okay? <laughs> So then I was just silent, okay, forget about that. But then when I um, ran um, some pilot testing for a different kind of study, completely different study, um, I was actually playing with this child where we bounced the ball around on a little trampoline and then this ball rolled away. And I thought with this idea in the back of my head, oh, maybe I can try this out now. So I tried to I reach for the object pretending like it was too far away and I can't get it back. And then sure enough, this toddler walked, um, stood up, walked over there and put the ball in my hand. And so when we saw this, I proposed this to my advisor, Mike Tomasello, that maybe this is actually testable, that we can maybe look into 
um, kids' abilities to read other people's goals and also learn something about their motivations. Why would they do this kind of thing, okay? And what and this triggered was a whole series of experiments to try to understand helping behaviors in young children. So let's look at an example of this. So here, this is a split screen. So you see an 18-month-old toddler on, on the left here, and I'm standing on, on the right here, um, and I hang towels on the clothesline. And then while I'm doing that, I accidentally drop a clothespin uh, on the floor and can't get it back. And what we see is that kids actually pick up the clothespin reliably in this um, situation in which the clothespin on the floor is something that I did not want to happen, right? And try to get my clothespin back. But importantly, we always match these situations with a control condition. In, in this case, I would stand there and throw the clothespin on the floor on purpose and not reach for it. And in this case, as you see here, kids rarely pick it up and return it back to me. So what this indicates is that kids are not OCD. They, they think like clothespins don't belong on the floor, or more realistically that uh, the reason they hand over the clothespin is because they want to engage in some social interaction or tell me, do that again, that was fun, right? So with this contrast between the experimental condition where I needed help and the control condition in which I did not need help indicates that kids were actually motivated to help me in that situation. All right. Here's another kind of uh, here's another helping situation that we in, um, created. So in this case, I first put a stack of magazines into this cabinet here uh, on the left, and then close the doors. Then go to the other end of the room to get more magazines, and then this happens. Oh. And what we find is that, again, these 18-month-olds help um, when the doors, the closed doors, an obstacle to my goal of putting the magazines into the cabinet. But they don't do it in a control condition in which first I had put the magazines on top of the cabinet and now closed the doors. And when I now return, I also bump into the doors, but because I had trouble putting it on top. And in this case, they don't open it, indicating that it's not some kind of stimulus enhancement where their attention is just drawn to the doors or they generally have fun opening doors in this situation. No, it seems like they are helping their behavior is actually tailored to my need, um, where in one case, um, the door should be open. In the other case, that would not facilitate my goal. All right, so these are situations where we find um, these helping behaviors. But then we made it even trickier for the kids. Because in this case, there's always a fairly strong signal about the kind of problem that has occurred and maybe soliciting the help from, from the children. But we would also, as adults, help in situations in which, for example, you walk along the street and someone drops a wallet on the ground, right, and just keeps going you would be able to infer that this is a problem for the person, even though the person is not signaling any need for help, okay? Um, so we tried to create this situation for um, toddlers as well. So this toddler here is playing with this zigzag ramp. This is just to locate them in the middle of the room. And while he's playing, um, our research assistant is, is putting away milk cans that are on these tables here. Um, but while she's doing that, um, one of the milk cans rolls off the table behind her back without her even noticing that this happened. In there, I'll put that one here. And then let's see, I've got this one. There's a big box like this. I'll put that here. And then here's a small one. I'll put that here. 
And then here's another, let's see, these are the same size. Let's put that here and put this one here. And what we find is that between 18 and 24 months, kids um, learn to help in this more proactive way, making the inference when help is needed in this case, and also contrasting it with the control condition, where in this case also the person um, previously didn't care whether milk cans were on the ground or on the table or in the box. And when now something accidentally rolls off the table, they don't pick it up and put it back um, on the table or give it to her. So again, this tells us that they're making an inference about the other person's need and then help uh, accordingly. Um, a recent finding by my colleague Robert Heppach and colleagues was that kids would um, do this in, in this kind of situation even when something falls off a table when the person is not even in the room, right? In this case, what we did was it was behind her back, but then they even help when the person isn't even in the room. So it's not that they get some praise for, for, for doing this. And the reverse is true, also shown in this study, that um, they do it when someone else does not see they're helping, but they also do it when they don't even see the person. So the way this was done was that basically there's a curtain between the child and the person, and the person um, then something falls between the, the cracks of the, the curtain, and the, the child can give it back through the curtain. Um, and they've never even seen the adult. They've not been familiarized with this person, complete stranger, and even in that situation, young uh, children help. So I think um, this is important for several reasons. First of all, they're able to make the, the right inferences about the goals that other people need and is, does not always depend on someone signaling the help for need. But the other thing is also that it's not based on some kind of reputational gain that the kids uh, get. So the issue is that, first of all, at, at 18, 24 months of age, you're not even cognitively able to process these kinds of things. But these studies show that even in the absence of Big Brother watching you, basically, they're willing and able to help in these kinds of situations. So this is um, also important to think about what really motivates that uh, helping. And it seems like it's because of the other person's goal and not some reputational gain for the self. Another reason why kids might help is that they expect to get a reward for helping, right? Um, but what we find is that even if there's no praise over and over again, kids help, even if no one says thank you, we explain that to the parents beforehand, obviously they very well know how to behave, but because it's an experiment, uh, we leave that out. Um, they also help when they never ever get a, a concrete reward for, for helping. As a matter of fact, in one study we found that um, rewarding children with some concrete reward can actually decrease uh, future helping. And this is how, how we did that. So we had 20-month-old children where during a first learning phase, one group of children would um, receive no reward for helping. So the situation was similar to this closed pen task where a person over and over again dropped stuff on the ground and reached for it, and then um, kids learned that they help, but she just continues with her task and never rewards them or praises them. Another group of kids, they learned that they can actually get paid for helping. So every time um, something dropped, she kind of bribed them by offering them a little toy, and every time they picked up the drop object, they would get that toy, okay? So that was the, the learning phase. And then later, in the test phase, the same thing happened, that, that this person dropped objects clumsily and um, um, reached for these uh, objects. However, now, in neither case would kids receive a reward for helping, right? So the question was, how does their learning shape their um, future uh, be behavior? And what we found is the following, that kids who previously had, um, never, had not received a reward for helping continued to help at a higher rate, but children who had learned that you get paid for helping were now less likely to continue to help. So what this is called in behavioral economics is crowding out or in psychology over justification effect where previously intrinsic motivation to do it just for the sake of the task is now replaced by an extrinsic motivation. So you do it 
as an instrument to obtain a, a reward. And so this is what we believe happened in these young kids, that um, originally they did it because they felt compelled to help the other person out. But once they learned that this is instrumental in receiving a reward, their motivation completely changes and they're no longer intrinsically motiv motivated to help. Okay, so far about rewards. The other side of rewards are obviously costs. So to what extent would kids help when it's more costly? And um, I want to mention one intriguing study by my colleague um, Jessica Somerville um, and her collaborators where she did this same basic thing as you've seen here, that an adult needed an object um, to complete a, basically a pyramid in this case. And what um, Professor Somerville did was that previously she assessed how heavy of an object these toddlers can lift. And then in the test, it was either a light object that was needed or was a heavy object, like heavy really meaning the heaviest object that they would be able to lift. And what she found was that here, kids were much more likely to help with a light object than they were with a heavy object, right? However, they still would help to a decent amount when it was a heavy object, but they made this cost-benefit analysis that um, when it's a light object, they were just more likely and ready to go than it was a heavy object. That makes a lot of sense, right? Because uh, it, we would also not help like in any kind of situation. There's a difference between can you pass me the salt um, versus can you drive to the grocery store and bring me the, buy me the salt and drive back, right? So we also make these uh, cost-benefit analyses and Jessica Somerville and colleagues show that that is already true in young children. Here's another way uh, in which you can test to what extent um, kids are willing to pay a cost uh, to help. So this is more of an opportunity cost. So what we did here is that, again, there's an adult who's dropping an object to the ground, but now this 24-month-old um, is playing in the ball pool, having a lot of fun. Mama, that's what they Hmm. So what we find is that kids continue to help even if they have to leave a fun game behind and when it's uh, some effort to climb out of it, um, which is also important to um, think about in terms of maybe in our prior studies, um, just hanging out with mom in the back of the room was boring and that's why they thought um, I, I better help to get something to do. No, if we give them a fun alternative activity, they're still willing to break with it and, and come and help. All right, so these are the kinds of studies that we've run um, to show that very young kids starting at 14 to 18 months of age are willing and able to help. And this, um, in, in terms of you've read about the um, replication crisis in psychology, I just want to point out that this basic finding about toddlers helping is really robust, has been shown across many different uh, labs with many kinds of variations showing that um, young kids are willing and able to help. I also want to point out that um, this has been tested in very diverse cultural groups and over and over again, the finding is that very young children in the second year of life are uh, willing and able to help. So when we look at um, this, I think we're in a fairly good position to argue that um, young kids are not just purely selfish, they also have altruistic inclinations. And um, because it's so early, it seems very unlikely that it is due to certain kinds of socialization practices, right? That is, requires an abstract understanding of morality um, to, to engage in these behaviors or some sense of reputation and so forth. However, the tricky thing with any of these kinds of claims is that you can always argue, well, they had 14 months to learn it. Maybe they really started out not caring about others and then were reprogrammed just faster than we believed. 
And that's a, a, a sticky issue for, for development psychology studying children um, for any kind of phenomenon. So what we really need to do is basically travel back in time to um, humans before these extensive socialization practices existed with societies and written norms and, and so forth. Last time I checked, we have, didn't have this time machine, but we have something that comes close to it, and that is to look at our evolutionary ancestors, such as the chimpanzees, um, that um, had a last common ancestor with humans five to seven million years ago. And the assumption is that if this is really a behavior that requires these kinds of socialization practices and social norms that you only find in humans, then you would not find this in chimpanzees. However, if chimpanzees also have these kinds of inclinations, then maybe there are deeper evolutionary roots to these uh, kinds of behaviors. So we went ahead and tested this, um, and I want to show you one example here. So this is um, a chimpanzee with an experimenter, basically like the clothespin task, only that the experimenter here is now pretending to, to clean the table. And what we found, to our surprise, we did not predict that at all, that also chimpanzees were willing and able to help in this kind of situation. And they do that um, even if they don't get a reward. They do it with a human, but they also do it um, with other apes. So when um, we create situations in which, for example, one ape is trying to go through a door and can't open it, uh, another ape might come and, and open it for, for that fellow there as well. So um, here I won't be able to go into detail, but there are many studies that have now demonstrated that also chimpanzees engage in these kinds of helping behaviors that have shown you in, in, um, for uh, um, human toddlers that they are willing and able to help as well. And this is also true to some extent. There are some studies um, with bonobos and the other um, uh, ape relative that shares a last common ancestor that lived five, lived five to seven million years ago with humans also shows these uh, kinds of behaviors. So what I believe we can um, conclude from this is that um, we really have some biological predisposition to also care about others that we share to some extent um, with our ape cousins as well. So this as um, empirical support for this notion that a very young kids, probably to some extent based on a biological predisposition, have inclinations to be cooperative, including an altruistic motivation to care about others. Okay, so what happens over a development? Sometimes this view is characterized as if it was only about um, nature that makes us uh, altruistic and social norms and so forth had no role. I've, um, I would not agree with this uh, notion. No, I think that learning experience and culture can build on this um, uh, early inclination uh, to, to help others and shape um, children's development over time. And one way in which you can look at this is to what extent kids become able to make the right decision about when it is a good idea to help someone and when it's not such a good idea to help someone. So this is characterized often as, as reciprocity because um, reciprocity shows that um, in this case, it is a good thing for red to help blue um, now if um, at some later point in time, blue is helping back red um, um, and reciprocates in this way, right? However, if, if blue is kind of a jerk and never helps back, it's just not a good life strategy to keep uh, helping that individual, right? So um, this is a very well-known phenomenon, but when you try to understand the underlying psychology of it, things become a little bit more complicated. So what do you really need to be able to do and know um, in order to engage in these kinds of reciprocal uh, relationships. Um, and one thing is that you have to be able to look back at how people have treated you in the past, right? You have to be able to detect who is a cooperator and who is a defector and be able to 
remember this and then also take the right action of maybe reducing your cooperation towards these people who never reciprocate, okay? The way we've tested this is with the sharing paradigm. So if you ever want to work in my lab, this is the kind of stuff that we built there. So this is our famous zigzag ramp where you need a, a basically a golf ball that you put in here, it slides down and then disappears. So we can use this um, very nicely in our experiments where now in this case, for example, the child is interacting with a partner and at the beginning they, they play this game, each has their own ramp um, and suddenly the um, child runs out of marbles, uh, out of golf balls. And the, the partner still has golf balls left. And the question is now whether the partner is willing to help the child out, right? So this is the first phase. And then during the second phase, we swap it, where now um, the partner runs out of golf balls, and the question is whether children are willing to help, okay? And what we find is that when we confront the child with someone who is never sharing with, who never shared with the child, as compared to someone who always shared when the, the child needed something, two and a half year olds are clueless. They continue to just share their balls with someone who had never shared with them. It is by three and a half that kids are differentiating. So if they are confronted with someone who um, when they ran out of balls, had shared with the child, they are happily willing to share some of their balls when the other one um, is in need. Um, however, and they're much less likely to do that when they're interacting with someone who had previously never shared with them, okay? So this indicates that kids start out more naively just sharing with, with other uh, people, um, and it's only over time that they learn um, to be more selective in when it's a good idea to, to share and when you're just basically being exploited by others, all right? So this is the notion of trying to look back about, uh, at how people have treated you in the past. But reciprocity also has this component that you might be able to look ahead at how someone will, um, whether someone will reciprocate with you uh, or not. And this has been captured in the so-called a trust game. So this has been extensively studied in adults. And the basic idea is that we have two people um, that engage in a reciprocal relationship of a very particular kind. And that is we have a lender who can invest something. So for example, give up, give up a certain amount of money uh, that is then in this case tripled. And the trustee can decide what to do with this profit. So the trustee can decide to just pocket it all um, and never, not give anything back or divide it up um, in, in some way um, and reciprocate, right? So this is um, basically the trust game or also often called the investment game. And it captures something really important about um, these kind of economic exchanges where um, the lender and the trustee can benefit from this deal, right? Um, but they also depend on each other because um, the trustee wouldn't have anything if the lender didn't invest some of the, the resources to begin with, um, but they have to trust that this trustee is actually gonna return some of the shares, right? So this is a very complicated thing that has been done with adults where you can just uh, explain the rules. Um, for kids, it's a bit more complicated. So what we try to do is make it more physically transparent about what this interaction entails. So the kids in, in our trust game learn that uh, they are in the role of the lender where they can decide whether to keep a token they receive. They, it's basically a, a coin, it's money that they can later exchange for prizes. And they can decide to just put it in their own bank and then they get to keep it safe, right? Or they can put it on this tray, and when they put it on the tray, um, they can put this tr push this tray through to the partner on the other side. And so the partner now has four coins, so this means it's um, uh, it created a profit, and the partner can decide what to do with it. The partner can decide to put a none sum or all in the child banks or none sum or all in, in, in the partner's bank, however they want um, to divide it up, 
okay? So that's the, the basic uh, uh, idea, and I'm going to show you a video how um, our, our A, Annie, is explaining it uh, to a child in case it wasn't clear from, from my uh, description. I'm going to give you a coin, and you can choose what to do with it. You can put the coin right into your bank to keep it, or you can put the coin into the tray to push it to the other side because it can only be pushed to the other side when it's full. So you can choose what to do with the coin. I want to put the coin in the tray. And you can push it over to Sally. And Sally, you can choose what to do with the coins. I can reach my bank, and I can reach your bank. Hmm. I'll put all four coins in my bank. One, two, three. I'm going to give you another coin, Anna, and you can choose what to do with it. Um, I can put it in a tray, and then Sally could decide what to do with it, or I could put it in my bank and I'd have that one for sure. I'll put it in my bank. All right. So what we did in this study is that kids um, interacted with an untrustworthy puppet, like this one, or a trustworthy puppet who split things up evenly each time, okay? And so what we now look at is the mean percentage of trials in which the, ch in which the child would share, right? They eat, and each time they can make the decision whether to just pocket it and put it in their own bank or invest it. And um, in blue, you will see what they do when they're interacting with a trustworthy partner, and in green, what they do when they interact with an untrustworthy partner. And what we see is that at six years, they clearly differentiate. From the trial one, they've learned that this is not a trustworthy person, um, and they don't invest. And the four-year-olds, they do it already to some extent. They are not so quick to catch on, but they are already starting to differentiate between a trustworthy and untrustworthy individual, right? So this again shows that um, kids over time learn the situations in which cooperation is a good choice versus situations in which um, that does not seem to, to be a good uh, way of going about life. All right. What this already um, indicates here is that kids maybe develop a notion of what's a fair way of splitting up the resources, right? So in this case, it was something where uh, the untrustworthy person would keep everything for themselves and the trustworthy partner would um, share, things very, uh, share things evenly. Um, and more generally speaking, fairness norms are obviously something that is really important for us to make the right decisions about uh, how to split up resources and equality is often used as kind of the norm about how a windfall gain should be distributed, okay? And the way this has been captured um, is what's called inequity av aversion. So the idea is that you might feel very differently uh, depending on which side you're on. So if you are uh, on this side where you get uh, fewer things than someone else, you might experience disadvantageous inequity. So you feel like, I got the bad deal, and you're unhappy about that. Um, however, if you're on the other side, um, you, it's also unequal, but you have more than someone else. In this case, you might f feel advantageous inequity that you have a good deal. However, the interesting finding is that in adults, um, people are often displeased with both kinds of situations. When they're acting, interacting with a, with a peer, um, maybe they feel, they feel more strongly about having less than others, but they often also feel like it's wrong that they would receive more than others and try to make things equal, okay? So this is the phenomenon of um, inequity aversion that comes in two forms, disadvantageous and advantageous inequity. So how can you test that in kids? So this is a paradigm that my colleagues Katie McAuliffe and Peter Blake invented, um, and it goes the following way. So we always have two peers, a so-called decider and a, a, a partner. They're both the same age. And now the experimenter puts out dis different distributions of Skittles in this case. So maybe an equal distribution 
or a disadvantageous um, inequity distribution, always from the perspective of the decider, or an advantageous um, um, inequality, okay? And the decider is called decider because they can decide whether to enact that distribution. Um, so that would be that they pull the green handle and these trays um, tilt outwards. So rewards go into the decider's bowl and the peer's bowl, okay? They can, however, also decide to reject the distribution where the two trays tilt inwards and everything goes into a trash bin, basically. Nobody gets anything, right? So this is a really interesting phenomenon because rejections mean that the decider pays a cost to prevent inequality. So to what extent do kids do that? So one robust finding over many, many studies is that disadvantageous inequity emerges early. So kids are willing to pay a cost to reject a bad deal where they get less than someone else. And this emerges early around four years of age. The issue is how do we interpret that? I mean, one interpretation is that they really think it's, it's wrong. It's not fair that it's not equal, but it could also be more of a competitive spirit. They just want to prevent the other one from, from having more. So it's not, more, it's not so much in the name of fairness, but maybe more a, a, a self-regarding a sense of equality. Um, a stronger test is advantageous inequity. So would children be willing to reject a deal that is good for them, relatively speaking? And we find that this is happening around seven, eight years of age, that kids are willing to reject a deal that would be better for them than for someone else. So this is kind of a stronger ca um, case for an equity aversion, all right? So this is what we find over and over again, but this was actually done with kids in Boston. And we know that this is a very special case, so um, most of the behavioral studies, more generally speaking, with adults and kids are done in Western societies. Um, there's an acronym, it's called Western Educated Industrial Rich and Democratic Societies, or also called WEIRD societies. So um, Joe Henrik and colleagues have coined this to point out that so much about what we think we know about human nature is actually based on these weird populations and are not really representative of uh, contemporary um, people and also certainly not of er evolutionary past. So what you really have to do is look across the globe and understand better what is going on in, uh, across culturally. So we did that with this uh, paradigm and tested kids in many different um, uh, cultures. Um, here are some images of this. The idea is that we use the same paradigm, this, this inequity apparatus. Uh, we lo use local candy, so we try to match that with local research assistants speaking in the child's language and so forth, okay? And so we test both for the tendency of disadvantageous inequity aversion or advantageous inequity aversion. And here are the results. So what is plotted here is the rate of rejecting an unequal distribution, right? So paying a cost to prevent inequality. And first, this is about disadvantageous inequality where the decider would get less than someone else. And in all cultures, we find that during childhood, kids um, develop into beings that are willing to pay a cost to prevent disadvantageous inequity. So this is something that is more, more um, cross-culturally uh, reliable. However, when it comes to advantageous inequity aversion, there is more uh, discrepancy across uh, uh, cultures, and it's actually more the weird societies that show this behavior of advantageous inequity uh, aversion um, th than in these other cultures. Importantly, this is about whether children would do that, so it's just a faster development in this case. So the claim is not that in other cultures, um, advantageous equity aversion does not exist, but it's just not something that as strongly develops er early on. So what we find um, in summary is that disadvantageous inequity emerges in children across all tested populations so far. Obviously, always more you have to test, but in our initial study with seven cultures, this is what we find. And there's more cultural variation for advantageous inequity aversion 
um, which maybe is more driven by local uh, norms. Uh, however, in cultures where we do find it, it consistently emerges somewhat later in development than disadvantageous in equity aversion. Okay, so um, coming back to the idea about what develops, I think what we find here is that um, a basic sense of caring about others shown in these helping behaviors emerges early, and then a learning experience and cultural norms um, for, further shape these um, developments. Um, and kids, for example, learn over time situations in which cooperation is beneficial uh, versus situations in which you're just being exploited by others and should reduce it. And we also see then more increasing cultural variation in the extent to which, for example, fairness norms then shape these um, um, cooperative behaviors uh, in, in children. Okay, if you're interested um, in this theoretical model, I've published recently a, a longer paper, um, How Children Solve the Two Challenges of Cooperation, synthesizing all this work and providing um, this theoretical uh, model. And with this, I wanna conclude and thank all the people I've been working on this and my current lab members at the University of Michigan. Thank you.